Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School. I'm Minister Cedric Hart and I'll be presenting Lesson 11 for November the 14th, 2021. We're still in Unit 3 entitled Visions of Praise. And our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Who's in Charge Here? Our devotion reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Uh, verses 9 through 17. Uh, background scriptures taken from the book of Reve Revelation chapter 11 and we'll be studying today from uh, the book of Revelation chapter 11 verses 15 through 19. Our key verse reads, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the Lord has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. That's taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 11, uh, verse 15 from the NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to define the nature of God's reign for eternity. Secondly, to reflect on how God's eternal reign affects our faith. And then thirdly, to engage in activities that reflect the sovereignty of God in healthy, powerful, and transforming ways. We have just two outlines that will be a part of our lesson. The first outline is entitled, Reverence for the Rain. And our second outline is entitled, Rejoice for the Reward. And we certainly thank and praise God to be able to uh, be with you today to share our Sunday School lesson with you. We hope that you are well. We're praying for you and your families. And uh, we certainly want to uh, continue to engage the Word of God even as we see uh, the day drawing nigh. We always encourage you to get your Bible and be prepared to uh, take some notes that we're going to share with you today. We have a lot of ground to cover in terms of uh, uh, sort of unpacking the book of Revelation. Uh, it can be uh, a little intimidating, if you will, to uh, try to absorb uh, all of the language, the symbolism that uh, that is contained in the book of Revelation. But we want to share some key points with you that we believe will will help you uh, in terms of your study. But I want to um, just touch on uh, a couple of points about this book uh, so we understand uh, the book of Revelation is essentially an unveiling from Christ. Uh, it was given uh, through an angel uh, to John and it was given in signs uh, and or symbols, right? Uh, but the key uh, to understanding uh, the book of Revelation lies in um, recognizing the type of literature that it is. I want you to remember that what type of literature uh, are we reading uh, when we uh, uh, come to the book of Revelation. Uh, so uh, the book of Revelation is known as apocalyptic um, this type of writing can be found in other parts of Scripture. Uh, but we want to uh, have you take a look at uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 13, uh, verse 10, uh, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4, also Daniel uh, chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, uh, Matthew chapter 24 verses 29 through uh, 31 uh, the gospel according to Mark the 13th chapter verses 24 through 27 and the gospel according to Luke chapter 21 uh, verses 25 through 28 and you'll be able to uh, get a gauge from these passages of this type of literature that we're looking at uh, in the book of Revelation. So apocalyptic literature features an unveiling of, of a big picture reality by a heavenly being 
a God or or angels to a human recipient but the reality that is revealed includes elements of both time dealing with uh, uh, the end time salvation and judgment as well as space uh, the reality of another uh, and or the supernatural world so if we can remember uh, these points when we start reading the book of Revelation and we start uncovering uh, uh, what John has been instructed to write uh, we'll be better suited to understand uh, this revelation or this unveiling if you will of uh, uh, that uh, Christ gave to to John uh, we have to remember that it was a very critical time in John's life you'll see that in the opening of the book of Revelation uh, and so we have to uh, uh, be able to remember that God wants us to hope in his future uh, not so much your future right your future may not uh, 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 encompass what God entails or what he envisions or what he reveals and so we have to remain hopeful in the promises of God no matter what uh, but I want to get into this biblical context and we, then we're going to share uh, another passage of scripture that I think it will help uh, uh, understand help us to understand that many times we have questions for God right we have questions about why he does not answer why he does not come to our aid why he does not uh, put an end to evil and destruction and all of these things that we find uh, 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 so negative in our day and time and we believe that sometimes we throw in the towel because it appears that God is not uh, 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 acting fast enough or perhaps maybe not at all uh, to suit our desires and, and but this writing this book of Revelation and the reason I'm laboring with you today is so we can understand that God has set the table on his promises and it doesn't matter as we re, uh, will uh, discuss later it doesn't matter what's going on who's doing what how much evil we see it doesn't nullify the promises of God because of uh, the discomforts of life if you will but the book of Revelation gives a prophetic glimpse of the completion of God's plan played out in three uh, separate acts act one uh, seals being opened and when you study the book of Revelation you will see this uh, seals being opened uh, act 2 trumpets heralding uh, uh, the arrival of God's eternal kingdom and act 3 bowls of judgment on those who reject God but the narrative comes to a climax as the lamb has opened the seals on the scroll releasing many frightening things the trumpets have blown and fears of the diff of a different sort uh, have come to pass but when the scroll was handed to John he prophesied in symbolic fashion uh, we, we will see him measuring the temple and sharing the story of two witnesses we will see this in Revelation chapter 11 uh, but from the smoke and fire of the earlier chapters a vision unfolds of God of the God of mercies grieving over his rebellious corrupt world but determined to uh, rescue and restore it watch this through the death of the lamb and now through the faithful martyrdom of the lamb's followers God has a plan God has a plan through Jesus Christ uh, when we start unpacking uh, the life of Christ we see that God had very specific things that uh, that Christ would do everything that Christ engaged when he was on earth was appointed it was anointed by God it was sanctioned by God uh, the the salvation that Jesus brought uh, uh, um, uh, was a plan was an orchestrated 
orchestrated plan from the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. And so I, I just want us to, to, to be able to be grounded in the hope of the Word of God or the hope of the promises of God as our title I ask the very good question, who's in charge here, right? Who's running things? Who's who's in charge of, of the affairs, the governments of, of things that are in our lives, things that uh, are going on around the world? Who's in charge of these things is the age-old question. But uh, one more point I want to make, um, um, and I want to give you Psalm 10. Psalm number 10. We're going to go there at some point and we're going to share some things with you over there because there's some parallel here uh, in what John was talking about here in the 11th chapter of, uh, uh, of uh, Revelation or the, some of the concerns, if you will. And then I see some concerns that David had in Psalm 10. Uh, which is essentially a song of confidence in God's triumph over evil, right? And we have to remember that, right? Uh, when we're in the heat of the battle, if you will, we sometimes forget the promises of God. We forget that God's in charge. He's running things. Uh, uh, he's in control no matter how chaotic the situation might be. Uh, no matter how many evils are in play in our lives or in our culture, God is in charge. But let's get into this first outline, the reverence, reverence for the rain. This is taken from Revelation chapter 11 verses uh, 15 through 17. And I want to read this uh, from the NIV uh, uh, translation that we might be able to get a better understanding. Verse 15, the Bible says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. Let me read that again. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God. Right? Verse 17 says, Saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. What does, it, does, does this mean for us now, right? Uh, 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 John is looking at, John is seeing here, if you will, or listening to uh, what is to come. He is listening to what has been accomplished. And he is describing here that what has been accomplished uh, of 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 the world, I, I, I like this. It said the world has become, right? The world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Messiah, and He will reign forever and ever. In our culture today, and, and certainly in the lives of many people, we may not be able to see this context. It may look like that it's not it's not going right or something's wrong but the word of God stands for a reason it stands to give the reader and this is one of the tenets of the book of Revelation the word of God stands to give us hope in the face of right in the face of adversity in the face of, of, of opposition uh, in, in the face of, of, of evil right running rampant everywhere. The word of God is given to stabilize the believer, those who read it, those who believe it, and those who trust in it, and those who hope in it. It stabilizes the believer because we recognize that in this vision or in this 
uh, unveiling, if you will, that John has recorded for us, we see God taking control. We see God taking thorough or full control of all the matters of the world. The kingdom of the world has become, right? The kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, of Christ. Everything is coming through or working through uh, 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 Jesus Christ because he is the one. He is the one that came to save. He is the one that came to deliver. He is the one that came to pay the price, right? So we could have such a relationship with God. So we could have such a hope. And this is what John is saying. And so in this scene that John is describing for us in verse 16, the 24 uh, uh, elders who were seated on their thrones before God, they fell on their faces and worshiped God. And look what they did. They gave thanks. They gave thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is. Catch this. He is the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Let's, let's talk about case by case, situation by situation. And we could do this personally. We can talk about how God came in to our lives personally. But we can see the transition of power, if you will, from those who believe they have it. Those would be individuals of the world. Those who believe they possess it. Those who believe they can run it. Those who believe they have the authority. But according to what we're reading today, something has happened. And we'll see later on in the text uh, 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 what happened as a result of God taking control of 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 these uh, matters and individuals who believe they had it, right? But when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, there appears to be a pause in the unfolding of events, uh, particularly known as woes that come quickly. But John recalls hearing great voices in heaven. They seem to lift their voices in, in unison, proclaim, proclaiming the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, those individuals, and you, you would find more context uh, for what I'm sharing with you in Psalm 2, but we're going to look at uh, Psalm 10 at some point, but I want you to take note of Psalm 2 and I want you to read that at it in its entirety because uh, right now in, in, as we look at the world today there are a lot of people in power uh, there are a lot of people in, in authority who believe they are above the authority of God and so over the course of time certainly in this context God has accomplished something in the in the in the earth in, in, in the reign of these individuals uh, because they refuse to recognize him as the authority, as the ultimate authority. They fail to recognize God as sovereign, right? We see this play out. And so what has to happen, uh, God has to humble individuals. He has to humble assumed authorities uh, uh, since these authorities won't uh, uh, subject themselves to the authority of God uh, uh, by uh, nature or certainly by examination of his word, then God has to humble them, right? You and I were saved because God humbled us. We recognized that uh, uh, we had a need and we sought God out. We cried out and he took authority over the conditions that were plaguing our lives and he saved us. But this passage here, this verse here, as it uh, reveals for us through John, this is more of a, a corporate uh, posture. And we're going to share that with you uh, uh, as we get to our second outline. Uh, but it, 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 it just highlights the fact that 
uh, God is the authority. This new kingdom is far different from any government that has risen of, uh, or, uh, and fallen throughout world history. God's holy rule, catch this church, uh, will last forever. Uh, verse 16 captures the high reverence of the 24 elders who were seated before God and fell to their faces prostrate before his presence worshiping him and this is something that uh, uh, certain authorities if you will certain governments don't want to do at this time but 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 we have to remember that God is working even when we don't see that he is working God is humbling people and cultures and uh, authorities and kings and princesses uh, beyond our comprehension uh, uh, but the word of God is telling us here that we can we can set our gaze on these promises of God because he spoke them out and so the worship has already taken place in heaven uh, 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 from the 24 uh, elders who were seated on their thrones before God they fell on their face, faces and worshiped look at the posture right Look at the recognition of these 24 elders who recognize this authority. And so God has to continue to move through the world, through our cultures. This is global until he gets to the place of scripture where it is fulfilled. We need to remember that. But the elders, they show extreme reverence and humility by leaving their positions of honor to fall before God uh, or before him with faces toward the ground indicating God's transcendent worthiness in comparison to themselves and this is something that people are not readily able to do at this point but let's just wait for God to do it let's just wait for what God said to continue and mind you some of these things have been fulfilled already but some of them are still on the table to be fulfilled and we need to continue to hope in this even though uh, the evil seems to be gaining the upper hand. Uh, the unrighteous thing seems to gain the upper hand. It doesn't seem to be any relief in sight. But don't forget what God said. Don't forget what we read to you. That the world has become the kingdom. Right? This has to do with people. This has to do with case by case, situation by situation, right? Authority by authority. And so uh, we can see there will be, according to the word of God, there will be a breaking point. And we're going to see that as we get a little bit further. But talking about these 24 uh, uh, elders here, their actions honor uh, God's right to rule over the entire world. While God has always held the, held the right to rule his own creation as Savior and Redeemer, he magnifies his reverent role in the universe. I love that. You know, God is so uh, universal. He is so global. He is so beyond our comprehension. And we just dismiss it sometimes because it's, it's not readily available to us that God is in control. It looks like things are out of control. It looks like people are out of control. It looks like authorities are out of control. And they are seem, uh, 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 seem to be running the table as though they do, uh, 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 don't have anyone to answer to. But the text says something different. The elders show the height of this reverence as they give thanks to the eternal God who has claimed his power and reign through the Lamb. While God's power was never diminished, it watch this, it was abused by the hands of those who usurped control of the world as sin prevailed. So God delivers us completely and is fully deserving of the elders' worship. Let us uh, forever give due reverence to God who reigns supreme on the earth. It's a great recognition when we can honor God as God. It's a great uh, 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 principle 
to be able to recognize authority just like we would uh, uh, on earth. We would see different authorities when different presidents or different officials come. There's a lot of pomp and circumstance for them and for their positions and uh, 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 there's a lot of recognition for them. But when we get to God, we seem not to have such a reverence, but he is the authority. And so what happened in man's uh, 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 abilities uh, as they had authority to do so they didn't act accordingly they didn't give God the glory uh, they took the glory uh, they, they, they took the authority as they own uh, 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 as their own and sometimes we have to be careful about acknowledging ourselves without giving due reverence to God that is the beginning of wisdom that's what the book of Proverbs uh, uh, helps us to understand that is the the beginning of wisdom when we can reverence and we can honor God for being God right he gets all of the glory he will not share that uh, with another but the question is asked here what do you say to those who believe that evil on earth is an indication that God's power is limited Right? This is the kind of hopelessness that we see uh, play out sometimes in our lives that we, we tend to give up because God is delayed. He's not moving fast enough. He hasn't answered quick enough. And so we begin to think that evil is just going to run the table. But I, I, I said to you earlier, I want to share Psalm 10. Let's go there very quickly. And this is something as we... Uh, uh, sort of contrast, if you will, from John's perspective to uh, David's perspective. David says something here, uh, Psalm 10, verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Watch this, verse 2. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have. De devised verse 3 for the wicked boasts of his heart's desire he blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord verse 4 the wicked in his proud countenance countenance does not seek God God is in none of his thoughts you see what John is saying now as we take a look back now at Revelation and David has some concern about evil uh, uh, the psalmist here is talking about uh, uh, why are you not acting God why are you not doing anything you see the trouble that's going on you see how the poor uh, is persecuted God and you're not acting but when we get to the book of Revelation God is saying here the world has become the kingdom of our Lord so the book of Revelation sort of answers all of these questions that the psalmist has here, right? Uh, uh, about confidence in God's triumph over evil. What gives you confidence in the face of adversity? That, that is what the question is asked here uh, uh, about those who believe that evil on this earth is an indication that God's power is limited. It is not limited. The book of Romans, I believe chapter 8 says, all things work together for the good for them that love the Lord and, and that are called, right, according to his purposes. But this is a beautiful illustration of, of, of how, and, and God is revealing this thing in a way uh, to John to help him in the crisis in his day, in his life, that he was not forsaken. All is not lost. The situation is not hopeless. Uh, so we need to remain vigilant in the word of God so we would be able to draw hope uh, when we are having adversity in our lives. I hope that makes sense for us today. But as we get into this second outline, talking about rejoice for the reward. This is taken from Revelation chapter 11 verses 18 and 19 and so now we're going to look and see through these verses as God has taken control 
right that it has caused it has caused some reaction uh, in the nations and, and so from the NIV translation verse 18 of uh, the 11th chapter of Revelation the Bible says the nations were angry right you and your wrath has come the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants the prophets and your people who revere your name both great and small for and for d destroying those who destroy the earth uh, if I could just help you to understand today it's going to come a time where God's going to put a stop to it right we may not realize it we may not grasp it at this time but God is telling us the nations got mad right the nations got angry because God was going to deal with them because the wrath had come the the divine displeasure if you will the divine judgment the sovereignty of God has stepped in and put things in order and put things uh, uh, back in the way that they should be uh, uh, God perhaps have had to remove some situations and some people if you will the nations got got mad because they couldn't do anything about the authority that's what the uh, first outline uh, told us that uh, 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 and if I can go back to verse 17 uh, the Bible says saying we give thanks this is the 24 uh, elders we give thanks to you Lord God Almighty uh, the one who is and who was because you have taken right <laughs> you have taken your great power and have begun to reign God's power you know there is no question there is no question about evil and what it will do and how it will be removed when the authority when the one who is in charge shows up right we cannot deny this kind of power uh, but verse 19 says then God's temple in heaven was open and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant and there were uh, there came flashes of lightning rumblings peals of thunder and earthquake and a severe hailstorm so what is John saying here the declaration of Christ's eternal reign is followed by a chant or a song of praise offered by the 24 elders who worship at God's throne. So while God has unified the world and received high praise for Christ's restoration acts, there are those in the world who are yet angry because of the display of God's wrath and judgment those who have firmly rejected God's love and grace can only inherit God's wrath judgment is at hand you know this is the equity that I love about God he sends his Christ to this earth Christ is publicly crucified he's humiliated uh, and so at the crucifixion, if you will, of Christ, we have to remember that's a signal and sign to God that his Christ uh, 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 and his message is rejected. So what are we saying to God when we crucify his son and we kill his we kill his son and we kill his message? What are we saying to God? Right? We are sending a strong signal to God. Even today, when we reject the knowledge of God, when we reject the message of God, when we decide uh, uh, that we are not going to subject ourselves, or as Peter says, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, uh, uh, in due time, God will exalt us. But if we don't want to humble ourselves under the word of God, what do you think is going to happen? And a better question, what do you think should happen? Do you think that God is just going to labor and strive with man as he has already told us in his word that he will not strive with man always? So we need to take this opportunity uh, since Christ is the centerpiece of this message and he is the one that is revealing uh, or unveiling, if you will, 
uh, to John what is to come, what should we take from that when the message is preached that we need to give or come to Christ now, that we need to give our lives to Christ? Uh, Jesus said it himself. He said, come to me, all ye that labor and of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But what are the implications if you don't do that? What do you think will happen? Or a better question, what do you think should happen? And so God has had, I can see it in this text here, God has had enough. Right? God has given space and he's given time and he's given warning and he's given uh, 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 his messages and he's sent his preachers and prophets and, and the like to encourage uh, uh, mankind, even those in authority, to subject themselves uh, to the word of God, to turn uh, 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 their uh, authority, if you will, or their faces to the ground and worship God, but they will not do it. What do we think should happen? Or a better question, what do we think God should do about that kind of posture? So right now in verse 18, the nations are mad. Divine judgment is, the, is, is dreadful for those who rebel against God. However, for those who have served God, watch this church, proclaiming his word and giving honor to his name, God's judgment is not a day of condemnation, but a welcomed moment of remembrance and reward. If I can just say this today to you today, if you are discouraged today, hang on in there, right? Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Right. Hold to God's word. Hold to God's unchanging hand. And so we have to remember here that God has a reward for those who stay faithful to him, who remain faithful to him and his word. So we don't have to worry about condemnation. What does Romans chapter eight, verse one tell us? There is therefore now no condemnation. Right. None, absolutely none for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus, you have been set free. So this is not a day of condemnation for you, but it's a great day of remembrance. It's a great day of rejoicing. It's a great day of reflection. You ought to thank God for saving you. You ought to thank God for humbling you even through the trial of the tribulation that you didn't want and I didn't want in my life but it humbled us to the place where God wanted us to be and we praise him and we thank him even in the midst of it and so we don't have to worry about this but those who reject the knowledge of God there is a cost those who rebel, those who have a, a mind, a prideful mindset that they are not going to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, this should be very clear to you that God is not pleased with that arrangement. God is not pleased with that mindset. And this is where the beauty of repentance comes into play and that we are able to uh, to ask God to forgive us for that mindset, that rebellious mindset that is only going to do us harm, right? So it's not a day of condemnation for those individuals who reverence God, but, but, but it's a welcome moment of remembrance and reward, right? So those who have served the Lord faithfully with or without public applause or acclaim. I want to just pause here to, you know, sometimes there are many of us who serve uh, 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 and we get, we seem uh, uh, not to get the credit, if you will, uh, and that's the wrong attitude that we should have, but I get, I get the point. We're not acknowledged for the things that we do. We are not recognized, but in this passage here, what we're sharing with you today, God sees everything that you do. God sees all of your faithfulness, not just some of it. God sees your heart. God sees 
uh, uh, you're struggling, but you're still uh, uh, trying to be faithful to the things that 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 uh, he has commanded of you, and he's going to reward you for that, right? But it's not easy. It never has been, and it never will be, right? So because we are struggling in a fallen nature amongst evil right we realize that every time we desire to do good evil is forever present but I want to encourage you today through this word today that God is going to take control if you forget everything else about this lesson you should remember verse 15 and I want to read it just one more time right I want to read it one more time the seventh angel verse 15 the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. You should never forget that because God is on the case. right? We should remember that. So our reward is sealed forever. God saw, or I'm sorry, John saw God's heavenly temple opened with the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, while this passage has many interpretations, most Bible scholars agree that it is a confirming symbol of communication between heaven and earth, right? another revelation of God's presence wickedness and rebellion watch this may flourish for a season but our ruling reigning redeemer Christ our Savior will one day shut the box on all that is evil giving us a never-ending uh, reason to rejoice that's what keeps us going right we don't have to worry about it but we do have to wait for it we don't have to distress ourselves about it but we do have to be patient because I would love to uh, uh, just you know we would love to get rid of all of these things right but we have to remember here the purpose of Christ as Mark would recount for us he came to seek and to save that which was lost so salvation is always on the table right especially for evil folk especially for those who are classified as sinners right those are at the near and dear of God's heart because they are the very ones who are sick and need a physician and so God will move heaven and earth to save a soul you should know that because he saved yours Right? So we have to remember that though we want God to eradicate evil, God wants to eradicate evil, but there's a side of God that wants to save. That's what John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. You remember that passage very well. So, so, so those who believe in him don't have to perish. God doesn't want anyone to perish. Even your worst enemy, we are responsible for praying for them. Don't exclude them. Don't just pray for those who do good to you, but we have to pray for those who do evil to us. And we do that so God can say, we always want to give room and space for God to save, right? And leave that individual. Don't, 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 don't get rid of that individual because there's qualities that God can bring out of them that you'll never be able to bring out of them. We know that's true because he saved you and he saved me. Question, honestly share a time of embarrassment when you thought yourself better than you actually were. That's my point. <laughs> but uh, what was the lesson learned, right? I believe Galatians 6 would add some context for that question. I hope you will read that at your leisure. But I certainly thank and praise God that just understanding that our God reigns supreme in heaven and on earth but there are times when it seems that the wicked will that wickedness will prevail 
and evil will go unchecked. But we have to remember that God is still in control. So will you allow him to reign in your life? Don't lose hope in the midst of sin on earth. God has already given us a glimpse of the glorious day when he will deliver us forever from evil. Right? So it doesn't matter how rough the ride or how dark the night. The good news is that we win in the end. We are victorious right now. This is our glorious guarantee uh, uh, of the reason for our unfading hope of victory through the blood of the Lamb. So we ought to praise God, right? We ought to praise the Lord who lives and reigns forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what your word has guided us to understand today. I pray for every uh, ear that is listening today. I pray for each and every family. God that uh, is struggling, I know, uh, even for the believer, it's tough for us sometimes because we endure uh, quite a bit. But we pray that you would uh, undergird us and that you would uh, just shower us with encouragement today and confidence in your word that we may not lose hope uh, in the face of adversity. We thank you that you have left us here uh, with an evangelistic message for those who need you and who need a relationship with you. We thank you for Jesus for uh, uh, bringing this example of loving kindness to this sinful world and paying the price that sinners might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for keeping us alive. We thank you for touching our hearts and our minds and we pray that you would open up our understanding that we might find a strength and comfort in your word. We, we just thank you for what you're doing in our lives and we love you dearly. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So again until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again. We say God bless you.